All roads lead to Gadsden. Rising out of the northern Tanaris desert, Gadsden is the capital city of the Steam Weedle Cartel, the largest of the Goblin Cartels. The city was once surrounded by the desert, but since Cataclysm, Gadsden was converted from a busy Goblin city into a busy beach fort capital. Some of the best goblin engineers, miners and alchemists ply their trade here. The goblins believe in profit above loyalty, thus Gadsden is considered neutral territory in any horde alliance conflict. Anyone with a fat wallet or services to offer is welcome in Gadsden. Both governments officially recognize goblin neutrality and for those who don't, the streets are heavily patrolled by goblin bruisers ready to pound to a pulp anyone disrupting their trade by instigating conflict. Of course, there are other elements in the city that maintain peace to a certain point. The city boasts many features including a port for all factions but also with a blanket of black fumes hanging over the city. Gatchan also has a subgroup known as the Gatsan Water Company. Now this uh, is an organization based around Gatsan, whose goal is to mostly farm wells in the desert. The majority of its workers are goblins, but there are some gnomes here and there, if you can ever find one. The water company runs the whole operation of building wells across the desert to farm fresh water, without which just about everybody in Tanaris would die of thirst. Gathering water or making devices to improve their water collecting methods dominate the water company's lives. They had thought of everything, deeper wells, methods to make it rain, condensation devices, plans to draw the salt out of seawater, even an insanely long pipe running all the way to the closest spring in the Thousand Needles. But it's not all just sunshine and uh, building wells. The water company has problems with the Waste Wander bandits who attack their wells around Tenaris. And, of course, with the South Sea Pirates, as if it weren't for them, the water company could ship in supplies from the Steam Widow, but the pirates intercept most shipping these days. So until they're dealt with, things will stay as they are. But let's go back to the city proper. The first mention of Gadsan is approximately two years after the end of the Second War. Back then, Charnas would open his bookstore there and Graydon Thorne with his brother Silverlane would visit it. Although goblin neutrality is almost universally acknowledged, there are still those who seek to sow chaos and anarchy. For Gadsden, this came in the form of the Waste Wonder Bandits, a gang of miscreants who occupied the Water Spring Field and Noonshade Ruins on the Northeast Tenaris. Few goblins care about ancient ruins, unless they have treasure. For all they care, the bandits could have the old blocks of stone. However, the Water Spring Field was vital to Gadsden's survival in the desert, which provided them with liquid gold. Water towers out in the field were constructed and maintained by the Gadsden Water Company under the blazing heat of the desert sun, so the goblins weren't going to give up their hard-earned towers that easily. However, the goblin bruisers needed to stay in town to keep the gnome's collective Napoleonic complex from getting out of hand and to stop the seemingly endless dueling among the various visitors from disrupting business. Therefore, it fell to brave mercenaries from all corners of the world to help the goblins in their time of utmost need. By this time, the city was briefly visited by Kova, Broadhorn, Mouse, Corbender, and Beltazor. Please do note that everything we've talked about until now is in reference to Gadsan before the Cataclysm, when it was still surrounded by the desert. Because during the Cataclysm, the ocean flooded in close to the town, turning the area outside the eastern wall into a beachfront property and obliterating the nearby Steam Weedle port, whose survivors moved into the city for a modest relocation fee, and destroying the water towers in the water spring field. What was an apocalyptic result for some, it came as a fruitful opportunity for Galatasaray to turn the city into an important neutral port. Shortly before the destruction of Terramore, Jin and Proudmore sent Star Sword, full of Terramore civilians, to Gadsden. Whatever happened there remains a little bit unknown. By the time of the Cataclysm, the city had already expanded, and it was described to contain winding and labyrinthian streets full of almost every known race of the human mind. The current leader and baron of Gadsden is Marin Noggenfogger. Yes, the same Marin that invented the Noggenfogger elixir. Somehow along the way, Gazlo got power of the Bilgewater Cartel and is kind of strong arming him into 
creating better work conditions for goblins and whatever. But let's be honest, goblins will always be goblins, and we're not sure how well that will last. But what's important to note is that Marin Noggenfogger isn't the only force in Gatson, because there are three others that are fighting for supremacy. And first of them are the Grimly Goons, led by Don Hancho. Now see, the grimy goons represent the disorganized crime of Gadsden. The goons make their money with petty crimes, bank robberies, extortion, blackmailing, and above all, their specialty, and major source of income of course, the smuggling and trade of illegal weapons. The three main classes you will probably find the grimy goons are hunters, paladins, and warriors. Hunters are amazing shots and represent the gun smuggling aspect of the faction, while the paladins and warriors represent the fact that the goons are the self-proclaimed law in Gadsden and make up the enforcers and brutes of the city streets. I ain't never met an enforcer like an angry paladin, pal. And they ensure that everyone on Green Street follows the rules, while warriors of course are the natural rough and tumble types. Considering themselves the toughest family in Gatson, the grimy goons control the Grim Street neighborhood. Their leader, the two-headed ogre Don Han Cho, recently acquired the first bank of Gatson. He, he takes a cut from the loot fence at the Gatson Emporium, and is currently preparing for a hostile takeover of all of Gatson. For this reason, he has been stockpiling weapons and recruiting new goons non-stop. And now... Sports the most muscle in the city and has arsenal stashed down every side street in Bolt Hole. The goons specialize in powerful weapons, including some very choice engineering and unusual weapons like piranha launchers and rock splitters. Hobart Grapplehammer and his people dole out upgraded gear through the city's pawn shops, and the goons also have access to powerful beasts from Gatson's arena. The typical attire of the goons includes hats, ill-fitting brown vests, pine strips, orange ties and suspenders. While not mandatory, this type of clothing helps identify members of the grimy goons during fights. About the Don, there are many things we can talk about. First of all, he is an interesting uh, ogre. He's a two-headed ogre. Two-headed ogres come with one head that has one eye and another that has two eyes. The interesting aspect is that Don Han Cho has two eyes on both of his heads. Which is the first time we're seeing this in an ogre. But enough about that. Let's look at a little presentation for the Don. First, our illustrious leader, the two-headed ogre, Don Han Cho. Han is a criminal mastermind, a real genius, and Cho? Lao Cho isn't the sharpest axe in the armory, but he hits like a runaway Kodo. More like a stampede of runaway Kodos. Maybe you heard that two-headed ogres got some serious magical chops, but not Don Han Cho. The Don don't need magic, cause he got us, the grimy goons. We done real good for him too. What with all the robbing, extortion, blackmailing, and yeah, all the good crimes. Not to mention our specialty, arm smuggling. You might think Don Han Cho has it all. He just bought the first bank of Gatson. He takes a cut from the loot fence at Gatson Emporium. And he got a tight grip on the whole Grim Street neighborhood. Believe me, Grim Street is just the beginning, my friend. Don Han Cho is preparing for a hostile takeover of Gatson. So he has been recruiting new goons non-stop and stockpiling weapons like you wouldn't believe. Now he's got a most muzzle and arsenal stashed down every side street and bolt hole in this town. When that coin drops, you know the grimy goons are gonna be ready. Now let's move on to the second faction that's fighting for control over Gatson. The Cabal. Need some mana quick? The Cabal got you covered. These crazy alchemists control the illicit mana trade in Gatson, and there's never a shortage of magic users looking for a little extra boost to their latest potent potable or cookie concoction. Just a warning, never drink what they offer you. You may up with a fuzzy coat of wool, or at the very least a killer headache. Emphasis on the killer. A faction of outcast magic users, potion peddlers, and master alchemists, they have gathered in Gatson to practice their illicit magic trade. 
Embracing those unwelcome elsewhere and embracing power no matter the price, the cabal consists of outcast priests, mages, and warlocks whose methods are considered too extreme for their colleagues due to incidents involving mutations, toxicity, and side effects. The cabal are led by the mysterious alchemist Kazakus, who distributes potions of corrupted mana. Under his tutelage, the Cabal have learned to concoct all manner of potions. Under his guidance, they are Gaston's master mixologist, brewing potent, overwhelming, petrifying, and explosive potions of power. All members of the faction drink Kazakola, a cold and refreshing beverage brewed by Kazakus himself, but which also acts to slowly erode the drinker's will and sense of self. The Cabal have entrenched themselves in the city's docks and control the Gatsin Mega Market, which gives them an easy way to traffic in ingredients required for their more exotic brews and for their couriers to distribute their wares throughout the city. Only the weaker brews, of course, they save the best ones for themselves. The faction uses many external sources of power, and all members of the organization receive special glowing crimson tattoos from Ink Master Solia. The Cabal take their corrupted mana, turn it into tattoo ink, and get ornate, detailed design tattooed on their bodies. Which not only marks one's dedication to the organization, but can also serve as a handy nightlight or a massive reservoir of power if a member ever find themselves in a situation where they need a little extra push of mana to cast a powerful spell. As many of the faction's potions are highly unstable, with some possibly even being powerful enough to level all of Gadsen, the Cabal uses enchanted chains to keep them stabilized. Now let's look at the Cabal's leader, Kazakus, or Kazakusan. Kazakus is in through a black dragon in the guise of an enigmatic Zandalari troll and master alchemist who leads the Cabal. Little is known about Kazakus and no one really knows his true origins. On the other hand, no one really cares. Instead, what matters is his vast knowledge of alchemy and the arcane and the corrupted mana potions he sells. Kazakus' motto is that power should be attainable for anyone at a price. Kazakus' tusks have become contorted and twisted due to the corrupted mana he uses, and the large red circles on the center of his stomach is a portal that goes right through his body to an unknown destination, possibly another dimension. The troll is responsible for brewing Kazakola, a cold and refreshing beverage drunk by all members of the Cabal, as we said before, which acts also slowly to erode the drinker's will and sense of self. Under Kazakus' tutelage, the Cabal have learned to concoct all manner of potions. Under his guidance, they are Garrison's master mixologists, brewing potent, overwhelming, petrifying, and explosive potions of power. Some claim that a back alley potion brewer couldn't possibly have such knowledge, and some are foolish enough to spread rumors that he's secretly a dragon, demon, or some other powerful entity in disguise. And these rumors abound of secret dragon people infiltrating gods in disguise, and certain depictions suggest that there may be more to the alchemist than initially meets the eye, as does Kazakus' hiring of draconoid spies to keep tabs on his opponents. And now for the last faction that deals in Gatson's mean streets, and that is the Jade Lotus. They are a family of assassins that move unseen by night as well as masters of the mystical and martial arts. Most of the Jade Lotus is made up of races that came from the distant shores of Pandaria. Pandaren, Hosen, Mantid, Jinyu, and even Vermin. They have found disciples in Gatsen, teaching their ways to eager new students. The family consists of rogues, Shaman and Druids that own the shadows, command ancient spirits, and bend the forces of nature to their will. An immense Pandaren warrior known as White Eyes leads the Jade Lotus operation, but unbeknownst to even most of the Jade Lotus' members, he is not the leader of the organization. Instead, he is merely a figurehead and sworn bodyguard and servant of Aya Blackpaw, the last heir of the wealthy Blackpaw family and the true leader of the organization. Using the Gatson Museum of Ancient Artifacts as her headquarters, Aya issues orders to the rest of the Lotus through her loyal servant while shrouding her activities behind her family's reputation as generous philanthropists. 
Most denizens of Gatson believe the Lotus to be criminals and mere thieves and assassins, and whisper fearfully of them in taverns and alleyways throughout the city. The Jade Lotus, once purpose in town has been to steal jade and jade artifacts from all over Azeroth, but not for wealth. Instead, the Lotus' secret lies in how the magic within the stones can be drawn forth to create jade golems, powerful living statues that do the faction's bidding. Many of the organization's members have been granted trinkets that can summon these warriors in the blink of an eye. Each jade golem they summon arrives more powerful than the last, and soon the Lotus are planning to unleash them upon Gatson. Now let's look at the jade Lotus's leaders, both of them. White Eyes is a massive Pandaren warrior who acts as the public figurehead of the Jade Lotus. He is said to be as immovable as a mountain, as pitiless as a storm, and as swift as lightning. When his name is whispered throughout Gatson, the hardened criminals shake in their boots, saying things like, Hey, watch your back, or White Eyes will jump out of the shadows and get you. Of course, these people don't know that the true leader of the Jade Lotus is Aya Blackpaw. White Eye's shoulder pad is an ancient and extremely heavy Pandaren bell, while his gauntlets are made from empty brewmaster kegs, thus demonstrating his immense size and strength. Aya Blackpaw is a young Pandaren and the secretive leader of the Jade Lotus. Aya is the last heir of the wealthy Blackpaw family, using the Gatson Museum of Ancient Artifacts as her headquarters and shrouding her activities behind her family's reputation as generous philanthropists, she issues orders to the Jade Lotus through her loyal bodyguard and servant White Eyes, who is incorrectly assumed by many to be the leader of the crime family. Aya is youthful, energetic, and seemingly impulsive. But that is a mask. In truth, she is calculating, ruthless, and as hard as the jade the lotus steals for her. Though she comes in a small package, she is quite deadly and cunning. She wields a spiked chain with an emerald tip. Crucially, young Aya has the unique ability to create jade golems, the powerful living statues that do the lotus's bidding, and she is the source of the trinkets that many of the members of the organization carry. How she came by this incredible power is a mystery, though it is hinted that she may have learned it by communicating with Kun, the Forgotten King. However it was that she came by her gift, Aya has successfully created an army of jade golems. What task she intends for them and for a jade lotus remains a mystery. Now that we looked at Gatton from a general point of view, let's look at a few numbers of the Gatton Gazette. Starting first with City Builds First Unbreakable Bank. After several explosion related delays, Goblin contractors finally completed construction on the new state of the art First Bank of Gatteson building today. Spokes Goblins for the contracting firm say the explosions were simply part of the contractually mandated break periods and no one important was seriously hurt. Despite the delays, the new structure is quite impressive. From its neon signs to its golden plated columns, it reeks of class. In cooperation with the bank's new owners, the mayor's office provided a tour of the new financial building for press and parties with an interest in the project. Mayor Nogginfogger, who owns the contracting firm that built the bank, led the tour group, proudly pointing out each new security feature in turn. The revolving doors at the entrance feature a codo-proof cage and unhexable glass. The bank lobby, tastefully carpeted in orange and purple, also features an anti-codo barriers at regular intervals. In addition, each teller's station is equipped with a large, red, candy-like button that when pressed releases a burst of confetti and dispenses armed explosives from hidden alcoves in the ceiling. Not one, but two sprocket spring 5000 vault doors on a fuse locking system protect cavernous vaults with plenty of room for gold, arcane dust and other valuables. Mayor Nogginfogger was quick to point out that each vault door is rated to withstand codal pressure exceeding several hundred tons and, as an added bonus, have a chance to blow up when tampered with. The previous bank was plagued by mismanagement and inadequate security. It was an easy target for the filthy, unscrupulous, coto loving bank robbers, Nogginfogger said. Our economy is taking off like a rocket chicken and Gatson citizens need a secure place to store their valuables where only the deserving can get to them. 
Thanks to a hefty investment by the new owner, the first bank of Gatsin is a wonder of technology and a fitting centerpiece for a beautiful city. In fact, I declare this bank 110% unrobable and I can't wait to see the look on the faces of any poor saps who try. When asked why the mayor's office would be concerned about theft after repeatedly denying Gatsin's skyrocketing crime statistics in the past, the mayor deflected to his security detail. Knuckles, would you be so kind as to escort this young lady outside? I think she wandered in off the street. Citizens can see the new building for themselves when the first bank of Gatsin opens to the public with a ribbon cutting ceremony next week. Moving on. Gadsden Port Promotes Prosperity Gadsden Port officials today announced court-breaking rates of trade as measured in tons of gold and cargo. Once a landlocked oasis on the fringes of the vast Tenaris desert, Gadsden's plucky citizens have truly risen above the disaster and capitalized on new opportunities to make it Azeroth's premier port city and shopping destination. Mayor Nogginfogger was on hand to celebrate the announcement by collecting docking fees and praising the port operators after he counted the earnings. The mayor cited Gadsden's new proximity to the Great Sea along with his policies endorsing low barriers to trade and disinterest in the silly laws and regulations espoused by less visionary counterparts in other cities as major contributors to the city's success. The mayor had no printable comment regarding the claim that his less fair policies have allowed a new class of hoodlum to flourish in the shadows, a change the mayor's office has staunchly denied. In addition to a vast, some have called a chaotic, network of docks and warehouses, the port district is home to Gatson's mega market, called the Mega East Market in the World, by the Gatson Board of Tourism. The influx of trade from just about everywhere has contributed to a huge spike in Gatson's economy, as well as the shopping district's growth. Locals claim you can find anything you could ever want and few things you don't among its maze of shops and stalls, from rare alchemical ingredients to exotic creatures and everything in between, all under one huge roof. We meet with Mayor Nogginfogger in the Mega Market's Chow Kingdom to grab a bite to eat and talk about the role that shopping plays in Gatson economy. The Mega Market is one of my favorite places in the city. There's nothing like the musical clink of gold coins to suit a goblin's soul, and it warms my heart to see the glorious gears of capitalism grinding away for the good of Gatson. The city is proud to play host to an institution like the Mega Market. It's a place where anybody can start turning themselves into somebody. When asked about rumors of mysterious cloaked and hooded figures linked with smuggling illicit potion parlors and strange red mana that seems to originate from the port, the mayor was incredulous. Ah, oh, well, conspiracy theories now, what is it with you people? I bet you'll be asking me about dragon people in disguise infiltrating the city next. Unfortunately, the mayor found pressing business elsewhere and departed before we were able to follow up with him regarding a promising new lead on a secret dragon people rumored to be infiltrating the city. Civilization comes to the city. A world-class museum is planned to open our beautiful city next week, elevating Gatson to a city noted for its first-class culture and sophistication as well as its booming economy and bustling industry. A generous grant from the noted philanthropist the Blackpaw family made the purchase of one of Mayor Nogginfogger's old mansions possible as a site for the museum, though the erstwhile abode has been updated with more understated styling in keeping with the museum's scholarly tone. Nogginfogger's old manor has history of its own as it was built over underground ruins which predated the original founding of Gatson leading some to speculate that the home may be haunted by restless spirits. A museum spokesman said they chose the site carefully since the ruins can be used to store artifacts for study when they aren't on display. While Mayor Nogginfogger repudiated rumors that his former home was haunted, he remarked, Have you seen those freaky statues the Black Paws shipped in when they bought the place? You should ask Madame Goya if those things are haunted. When asked about his unfounded superstitions and obvious disdain for ancient cultures, the mayor replied, I really don't know why I bother talking to you, lady. Though the museum already possesses an enormous collection of arcane artifacts, museum administrators are still solicitating new exhibits from the citizenry. 
Gazin position as a trade capital has made it possible for normal citizens to put on an archaeologist's hat in order to sift rare and interesting finds from the flow of goods throughout the city. The museum will be offering free artifacts appraisal to all museum visitors and has announced that they will offer gold rewards and accept donations of artifacts suitable for the coming Mysteries of Pandaria exhibition. For generous citizens who choose to donate their findings, curator Madame Goya promises to credit the finder on a nifty plaque. The museum may have difficulties putting the finishing touches on its jade exhibition. The demand for the precious green stone has gone up in Gatson recently, as residents report a spat of jade curios and jewelry disappearing across the city. Could the thefts be related to nighttime sightings of shadowy mass figures leaping from rooftop to rooftop? Be sure to buy next week's edition of the Gatson Gazette to find out. Bank burgled. A group of armed hooligans riding a huge armored kodo emptied one of the first bank of Gatson's vaults during a daring daylight raid today. Several crates of jade antiques, a quantity of arcane dust, and bizarrely a number of unused hearthstone deck boxes were taken in the robbery. The suspects, described as a bunch of ruffians wearing brown hats and vests with orange ties, rode an enormous heavily armored kodo through an exterior wall of the first bank of Gatson and directly into a high security bank vault. The destruction triggered the bank's anti-theft mechanisms, dropping anti koto bars across all doorways in the building. The bars prevented the bank's bruisers from reaching the boisterous bandits who reportedly took the time to swim in a pile of gold coins, make rude gestures and repeatedly exclaim outstanding and astonishing before disappearing into the city with the valuables. The new owner of the bank, a two-headed ogre by the name of Han Cho, was strangely calm in the wake of the robbery. The ogre's mustachoid right head, Han, spoke for them both. Hey, it's a bank. You put a bunch of valuables all in one place and it's only natural that somebody's gonna try to take it. These things happen, right? Fortunately, the first bank of Gatson is prepared to offer low-interest loans to bank customers who are urgently in need of funds and insurance to cover losses in case of further theft. Terms and conditions may apply, of course. The Blackpaw family, whose valuables were stored in the vault, released a simple statement. We are confident that the one responsible for this vile act will be found and punished. Severely. Some think the robbery was an inside job. One bank employee agreed to speak with us solely on the condition of anonymity about the robbery. The employee, who is a 3 foot 3 inches male goblin with a tattoo of a coin on his wrist and a scar above his left eye, was quoted as saying, Come on, how they know which wall to knock down. Story will be continued on page 3. Tuscar Bros under investigation. Funnel cakes fake? Fraudulent foodstuffs found? Gatson's mega market officials announced today that all 17 Tuscar Bros Funnel Cakes franchises located in the shopping district's world famous food kingdom are under investigation for peddling fraudulent foodstuffs and have been closed pending the results of the investigation. An unpaid and wholly independent investigator made a statement. The preliminary results of our investigation of the Tuscar Bros conglomerate of food shacks are very concerning. Mega market customers are becoming seriously ill and we blame Mayor Noggenfogger. His irresponsible lack of regulations is allowing hucksters like the Tuscar Bros to sell substandard funnel cake to the public. Look at this one. The meat is obviously undercooked. The Tuscar Bros also claim that all their funnel cake is freshly picked, but this pathetic example has wilted leaves and seems to be made out of plaster. Food of this quality is unacceptable for the Gatson mega market, and it's unacceptable for our fine city. A spokesperson for the mega market revealed plans to replace the Tuscar Bros franchises with new mega market branded funnel cake stands offering ice cold Casa Cola to thirsty customers. While the shop closure has burned the Tuscar Bros, their competitors haven't been loafing around. New shops have risen across the city seemingly overnight, from high-end shops cartering to the upper crust with dough to spare, down to more affordable options. The new businesses are proof that there is a need in Galson for hot new pastry providers. Crime family feud heats up. Pick a side or pick a new town. 
Citizens are calling last week's brawl in Talan's bar the fight of the century. The scuffle allegedly initiated when a notable member of the grimy goons crew spilled his frothy black fizz, a popular cider food critics refer to as non lethal, on another patron's candle. I saw a Kobo slap one of them goons in the ear with a fish, a live fish, said one bystander before he was polymorphed into a frog. I was like, where'd that fish come from? Guess that'll teach him to touch candle, ribbit. Within the attention span of a rabid murloc, patrons recall the establishment filling with henchmen, minions, sheep and elementals of all stripes. They broke through the windows and kicked down the doors, recalled the bar's proprietor. And if you're gonna use my bar as a boxing ring, I expect a cut of the purse. The fight comes at a time in which relations between Gaston's crime families, the grimy goons, Jay Lotus and Cabal have never been more volatile. Does Beardo really have the best deals anywhere? Gatson King of Bling to host Wealth Seminar. Join Beardo, one of Azeroth's most experienced auctioneers at Gatson's Auction House, next weekend for a seminar that promises to change the way you buy and sell weapons, armor, trade goods and more. I'll teach them how to stay on their toes and they aren't conned into bad deals or rackets, said Beardo. We'll help them learn the value of the market when it's time to pay. A gnome who attended Beardor's seminar last month had this to say. I don't have to roll need anymore. I contribute to my guild bank and still have gold left over to visit Ulduan for vacation. Beardor has been called a 5-drop to be reckoned with and 1-goblin financial advice powerhouse by Stormwind Scryer. Seminar open to all factions, ganking will not be tolerated. Directions, first building on the right from the city's south entrance, underground. Gats and Gala boasts a bevy of bourgeois. Or bourgeoisie. Ritzy Sorier, a magnet for magnets. The glitterati gathered at Mayor Noggenfogger's mansion this week for Gala celebrating the socialites, intellectuals and business leaders whose brilliant efforts have made Gansen the envy of Azeroth. All the city's best and brightest were in attendance, including the heads of Gatson's finest institutions. The First Bank of Gatson, the Gatson Mega Market and the Gatson Emporium, and of course, the Gatson Museum of Ancient Artifacts. It was a raucous event and raised voices often drowned out the live band. Mayor Noggenfogger gave a moving toast. Gatson is truly the jewel of Tanaris, but it wouldn't be what it is without all of you. Together, we've turned a dusty little desert pit stop into the best city anywhere. A place where legitimate business people can make their fortunes. A place where the arcane arts can be researched unfettered. A place where the mysteries of the past can be held up to the bright light of day. So here's to you, my fellow citizens. Here's to our beautiful city. And here's to everybody getting filthy rich. Take a complimentary sample of my elixir and don't forget to vote. When questioned afterwards regarding complaints of skyrocketing crime rates, Mayor Noggenfogger was dismissive. We're here to celebrate Gatson, kid, not talk about those clearly spurious allegations. Oh hey, look, a distraction! The inaugural gala ended ahead of schedule after some particularly lively conversation. According to various spokespeople, the industrious attendees were eager to leave behind their social obligations and get back to work on behalf of the city. First Bank of Gatson opens under new management. Record number of new loans issued. A clear indicator of Gatson's booming economy, the First Bank of Gatson reopened for business today under new ownership. A partnership of one. The unusual new owner of the bank is the two-headed ogre, Don Han Cho, and if his gleaming new bank building is any clue, it seems that two heads really are better than one. The fully renovated structure features new high security vaults and the latest of goblin anti-theft technology, and the proud owner pledges that the citizens of Gatson couldn't possibly put their valuables in better hands. Smartly dressed in half suit, half vest, the new proprietor of the first bank of Gatson's left head, which goes by the name of Cho, had this to say after cutting the ribbon. This bank good. Plenty of dough. His right head named Han continued. Please pardon my associate's rough manners. I am proud to say that the First Bank of Gatson will serve as a symbol of wealth and opportunity for all of Gatson's citizens. If you are one of those wealth-seeking opportunists, come see us. We'll beat any competitor. 
After the departure of the Steam Widow Cartel, the bank had fallen into disrepair. That gloomy chapter appears to be over, and the new First Bank of Gatson stands as yet another testament to the city's continued strides towards a very bright future. Help Wanted section. Special Delivery. The Gatson Mega Market wants you to deliver packages. Our discerning clientele requires merchandise delivered round the clock, flexible hours, great pay, experience handling incredibly dangerous volatile fluids, a bonus. Skin game. Solia is looking for the arcane and artistically inclined for tattooing apprenticeships. Put your arts to work and make an everlasting impression on our clients. Two plus years summoning and binding experience needed. Be a hero. Gatson's booming population means lots of lost pets need to get back to their loving homes. From kodos to kitties, you'll wrangle beasts great and small. Gatson's Critter Control, a subsidiary of the Gatson Mega Market, needs your help, and so do those pets. Cracker Jack with a chisel. Experienced stone mazels can make big dough restoring statutory. Inquire within at the Gatson Museum of Ancient Artifacts. Hey, beefcake. You big? You strong? Gatson's competitive, fast-paced construction industry needs big, strong workers who don't ask too many questions. Wanted Engineers. Part-time, entry-level position, please have your Mega or Geek certifications. 5 plus years experience required. Must not be allergic to fish or guns. Cleaners Wanted Based in Westfall, our organization is now the fastest growing janitorial operation in Gatson. Get in on the ground floor. We are seeking energetic, motivated applicants who are ready to enter the exciting world of the custodial services. Be your own boss. Make fast dough fast working from home distributing small goods for us. Do it on your own time, on your own turf, on your own hours. Arts and Leisure, Gatson Museum and Epicenter of Archaeology. Affluent aficionados of antiquities attended gala. For years, hopeful historians had no alternatives but to visit dusty old iron forge for the study of archaeology. With the recent opening of the Gatson Museum of Ancient Artifacts, our beautiful city takes her place on the world stage as the premier destination for the study of the ancient past. The enormous and tastefully appointed museum hall features an intriguing array of arcane artifacts from exotic locals around the world. Speaking before a throng of the opening galas elegantly attended attendees, Madame Goya, the museum's curator, had this to say. It gives me the greatest pleasure to welcome the people of Gatson to what is now surely the world's finest museum. This, of course, is only the beginning. Our ancient past conceals wonders untold, and I am confident that you will find our future exhibits to be most thrilling. The Gatson Museum of Ancient Artifacts is made possible by a generous grant from the Blackpaw family. Readers may be familiar with our article detailing their other philanthropic works in the city. Don't forget, the museum is currently offering free Pandaren artifact appraisals to visitors. That dusty jade figures in your attic could be priceless artifacts. Sports Knuckles defends arena title and mid-accusations of performance-enhancing bananas. Claims, I get my fruit from trees I knock down with my bare hands like everyone else. Spectators at the Thunderdome were treated to another dazzling display of swift victory last night by 32-time arena champion. The run of show included Knuckles pulverizing a paladin, manhandling a Meccano Strider and trouncing a team of 25 murlocs, armed with nothing more than his watermelon-sized fists. It seems Knuckles may be an unstoppable force in the cage. What can I say, the apes got the gift, recalled the arena fight promoter. And lucky for me, he's satisfied getting paid in produce. Sport critics have been suspicious of Knuckles ever since the revelation that the fruit Knuckles is so fond of comes from a banana tree near a tainted pool by San Saro Watch. I've seen goblins go swimming in San Saro and come out the size of orcs, said the proprietor of Mad Larry's completely legitimate watchers. Given the unregulated nature of the guts in arena and officials' fear of being torn in half by an ivory gorilla, it's unlikely that any actions will be taken. Lifestyle. Population soars, business roars. Commerce and competition are overflowing. It has never been a better time to be in Gatson. 
The improved job pipeline has new residents flooding the city. As the population swells, ingenious inventions and curious characters have found a place here. Minions of all types are venturing to see what all the commotion is about in Gatson. When asked about the state of the market, Beardo reckons, Gatson is good and ready to be competitive with Nomargon again. The city's positively aglow, said one local plumbing proprietor. I used to be a doomsayer, but Godson has really turned itself around. The tides have definitely turned in this city. I welcome new residents with open arms. And this concludes our lore video on Gatson. If you managed to reach it this far, please remember to like, comment and subscribe because it helps the channel grow. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you in the next one. Arrivederci.